Afternoon, everyone. So the focus of this panel is going to be funding the real economy, looking, what our, looking at what our companies really want. Um, I guess just to maybe set the background uh, uh, briefly, I guess one of the most damaging side effects of the uh, financial crisis has been uh, a relative freeze in lending to, to small businesses. And I guess almost five, six years on, the, the effects are still there to see. Um, yet the majority of uh, post-crisis reforms have uh, not really focused on, on this area specifically. I mean, there's still issues about the stability of financial markets and you know, making sure banks are ad adequately capitalized and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, obviously these, these kind of reforms are, are critical, but um, we need to make sure that you know, we can incentivize uh, funding, funding to SMEs and make sure that that's not forgotten. Um, I guess it's also important to note that you know, this is not just limited to the small and medium companies. Obviously, as, uh, you know, as uh, Seth was just talking about, there's market structures getting you know, ever more complex and people are dealing, uh, larger companies are dealing with um, uh, complex market structure issues that leaves them sometimes with little sense of where and how their stock is being traded. Um, so we're going to look at this uh, on this panel, uh, what companies want, and uh, then get some views on you know, if, uh, if we could set the EU agenda, then, you know, what are the things we, we'd like to see? Um, so to uh, introduce the panel, uh, uh, closest to me is Philip de Backer, MEP and uh, reporter of a, rapporteur of a recent paper on improving access to finance uh, on SMEs. Uh, I'm Minta Saladzin, who's uh, CEO of the uh, Lithuanian uh, Stock Exchange run by Nasdaq Comex. Uh, Martin uh, Ziegenbalg, who's EVP for Investor Relations at Deutsche Post, I think it's particularly good that we've got the view of an issuer on, on the panel. Um, we've got uh, obviously J Judith uh, Hart as well. Um, R.K. Uh, Lindenberg, who's a partner at KPM, KPMG. Um, so I think to start with, I'd like to get the, uh, the panelists first to, to do an introduction and, and just to talk about the issues that are kind of most, most relevant to them, perhaps starting with, with Philip. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation um, to give a little bit of background on the paper that the European Parliament uh, adopted in February on uh, the financing of SMEs. Um, SMEs have become, over the last couple of months, the new darlings of many politicians. They have discovered that there is something wrong, but people who have known about these markets already saw, of course, a long time ago that uh, SMEs indeed would be the first ones uh, to really start suffering from this, not only financial crisis, but also some of the regulatory issues that uh, uh, have come about uh, during the last couple of years. Um, I also believe that um, we have seen over the last couple of weeks and months uh, a lot of interesting papers coming out on SME financing and solutions. I don't believe that there's a silver bullet. Uh, I think the problem is, is much more wide and complex than uh, than many of the papers or solutions that are being proposed. So there will be no one-size-fits-all solution that will solve all the problems. There are different types of SMEs, uh, of course, across Europe. There's also differences uh, between the member states in how these companies are being financed, although the majority of companies in, in the European Union are still being financed through classical bank lending. And I think this is where the problem starts. Um, if you, of course, implement certain types of regulations of which you know that this will squeeze out some of the uh, bank lending towards SMEs and there's no replacement in sight directly because capital market structures are not uh, uh, developed enough or also the mentality of entrepreneurs is different compared to, for example, the US where uh, the interference by, for example, private equity investors is much more accepted than, uh, than it is in the European Union, uh, then you create your own problems, so to say. So what I try to do in my report in the European Parliament is, is really to have uh, a focus on concrete action that we can take. Um, we started out by a little bit of the discussion uh, on what, what are the, the problems, a little bit of an analysis. And there, of course, you, you really uh, quite quickly already stumble upon the, the regulatory framework that has been put in place in the European Union, where there has been this kind of silo approach trying to regulate separately with also impact assessments separately for every little part of the financial sector. But nobody still has an overview of what, how these different parts of regulations really are interacting and how this is affecting not alone the, uh, the selection of asset classes by, by uh, institutional investors, but also how this is now spilling over into the financing of the real economy. Uh, so, so in that respect, I think that was the first problem that we have tried to, to identify. 
But then on top of that, of course, uh, and we all know the European Union, there are the differences between the member states. Um, there are also there are different tax incentives, different subsidy schemes, different guarantee schemes for lending, for example, which are available, which is also distorting and also again fragmenting uh, the market uh, within the European Union. So there we really see two of the, the basic problems that we see, I think, and one of the biggest challenges, I think, for the next mandate of the European Parliament, but also the European Commission, will really have to be to take an in-depth look on how all these types of regulation are influencing the financing of, of, uh, of SMEs and what can be done about it, how can we restructure some of these types of regulations, which were, of course, and I think we all agree on that also, were necessary in order to really also st stabilize the financial markets. The second point that I tried to make in my, in my report was really that entrepreneurship as such and, and making Europe competitive again and reconnecting with growth and jobs is really is dependent on an ecosystem. It's not, again, one solution that will provide everything. It's really, and we heard the word already a couple of times, I'm a biologist by training, so I'm a very happy man that we, that we start using this term of an ecosystem. The financing of these companies, of course, is also dependent on the stage of the companies. Uh, a small, high-tech, uh, uh, fast-growing, innovative company has other financing needs than uh, the, your, your, your little shop on the corner of, the, of, of, of Main Street. It's a completely different type of companies, and they all need tailor-made types of financing. So a diversification in the types of financing, I think, will be crucial. Away a little bit from bank lending, develop more capital markets. And there, of course, you have a, a pull and a, and, and a push. On the one hand, I think it's really important that we also as, as, as Europeans, and I think this has been a debate this morning already, how you can develop these market structures to really also uh, pull companies towards, for example, getting listed. Uh, out of the 23 million SMEs that are uh, uh, active in Europe, only 6,000 are, are listed, so it's really a low number, so it's really something that we should do because if there are no exit possibilities, the initial investors will also not step in. So I think this is also linked to, to each other. Secondly, of course, there's also, and this is also mentioned in my report, we have to work about uh, on, on, on the entrepreneurial culture because there you also see that oftentimes, and I think here in, in Germany you see it with the Mittelstand, but also in Belgium, my own country, you see it with all the smaller SMEs. They don't want any external uh, investors in their company. They're family-owned companies. They're really reluctant to have somebody stepping in there and providing capital. So also there you need for, for part a mentality change. And also I think we need to invest much more in education uh, of our entrepreneurs in the sense that oftentimes when I was still working in my, uh, my venture capital firm we saw business plans being proposed which were just not feasible. Uh, without any financial background, without any uh, real market study. So really also the education of the entrepreneurs, especially for smaller companies, to make sure that they can present their business case in an adequate way to investors or to, to, to banks, I think is also an important step uh, forward. Um, we have tried to, to put forward in this report many, many uh, very concrete measures because, like I said, I think we have seen enough reports and enough talking about how we're going to solve this problem. I think it's time for action. Uh, especially at the European level, I think there's a lot of things that we can do, but also at member state level, there are many, many things that can be put in place to really uh, put forward these, these smaller companies and make sure that they can grow to become the multinational companies uh, of, of, of tomorrow. And of course, also there, you need to foster the ecosystem of entrepreneurship, of investors, making the links between the smaller, the medium-sized and the larger companies, because they all have to interact to be able to really sustain this ecosystem of entrepreneurship and trying to reconnect Europe with uh, growth and, and jobs. And I think that would be the main message that there will be no silver bullet, no one size fits all. We really have to think really broad, very holistically about how we can support these smaller companies to be able them to grow. Thank you. So I'm into uh, what comments on the kind of the mid cap side of things. Okay. Uh, standing in for Didre, uh, who is so passionate and eloquent about this topic, is uh, uh, no doubt a big challenge. Uh, but uh, isn't it what we are dealing with every day? <laughs> so we get trained, I think. And uh, uh, at least I'm in a really good company. So thank you for the challenge and for the opportunity. Um, getting back to the fundamentals and the role of the uh, exchanges in financing the real economy is really the, the topic of the day. And even more so in the smaller European uh, markets, uh, which emerged in the new market economies uh, just two decades or even, uh, even less uh, ago. Uh, as the head of the Baltic markets at NASDAQ OMX, I oversee operations of uh, three smaller exchanges in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, where we trade equities, uh, uh, bonds and uh, fixed income and, and funds. And I'll share a few insights of the challenges that we are dealing with because uh, for the equities part, uh, we are entirely an SME market. We are not in a blue chip business per se. 
Uh, and uh, the, the largest companies uh, listed on, on the Baltic market uh, have a market cap of around 600 million euros, the smallest uh, just a couple of million. And uh, uh, the average market cap of a Baltic listed company is 7 to 4 uh, million euros, just to give a, a sense of, of the size we are talking about. And this environment is, however, not an exception because we have uh, a lot of European exchanges who have uh, smaller companies and some of our peers really have uh, a very similar situation where all companies would be SMEs in, in the European uh, terms. Uh, at the same time, uh, this is why we are here, uh, we cannot neglect that part of the economy because it, it, it is really the, the engine of, of the of the European economy and, and our national economies and these companies have the biggest potential for, for growth and, and job creation. Um, though I'm a real fan of, uh, of the saying that it doesn't matter who's small and who's big, it, it uh, rather matters who's getting uh, smaller and who's getting bigger. But um, I think when we talk about um, capital supply for companies, unfortunately or fortunately, size matters. Um, and what we are seeing in the Baltics is uh, that uh, the a combination of post-MIFID fragmentation and, and being in, in that, um, you know, uh, uh, the, with, with that size of the market, we do not see competition from um, MTFs. We are talking about uh, really the split between OTC trading and, and exchange trading. And the financial crisis uh, has significantly uh, affected the uh, the trading volumes on our markets and what what we observed uh, was that uh, foreign investors uh, flee uh, the markets to deal with their issues with the big issues um, and then we were left in a really our companies were left in a total vacuum situation because of the barely existing domestic institutional base and, and domestic uh, financial community uh, the capital supply side in, in the Baltic uh, uh, economies is uh, heavily dominated by the foreign banking sector, specifically uh, Nordic banks. And uh, corporate lending, investment banking, asset management, uh, until very recently even venture and private equity side are all under the same roof. Uh, so what do we have is basically that when a company approaches a bank, the ba with a financing need and request, it is entirely in the, in the hands of the bank to decide not only if they want to finance a company, but what uh, tool, what instrument to choose. Uh, until the financial crisis, it has been loans, loans, loans. That, that was the only answer at any actually stage of the, of the company development, whether we were talking about technology startup or, or large uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, what we saw, uh, obviously, post Lehman was that the tab closed overnight and it hurt. It really did. Uh, everybody, business still remembers and, and uh, that how much, uh, how much it, it hurt. Um, so we, we also can see that in, the, uh, in this financial distress situation, uh, the foreign banks uh, turned entirely to their domestic problems, their issues. And uh, Baltic, uh, Baltic markets have become uh, really uh, neglected. So now uh, loans are basically the, the, the dominating and almost, I would say, only source of financing. And it is available only to uh, the largest, best performing uh, companies. Uh, the biggest pension funds, uh, which obviously would, would uh, come into play here with uh, quality long-term money, uh, uh, these are also run by, by, the same, uh, by the same asset management companies who be belong to the same banks and investment decisions are made in Stockholm, Oslo, uh, for some in, in London. So obviously uh, Baltic equities and corporate bonds are teardrops in, in, in terms of the you know, investment that um, uh, they get uh, from the assets under management. It's around 1% of the of the total uh, Baltic pension fund money uh, that is being invested in the local economy through equities and, and corporate bonds. Uh, very recently, uh, two of our main market companies were just turned down uh, a, an investment in their corporate bond issues by the same pension funds. 
uh, whether it was lack of you know global rating and we are talking again about the companies of you know cap at, uh, cap market cap 70 million euros on average uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the overall comment was made that basically there are five, maybe seven Baltic companies which would be, uh, they, they would invest in. So this brings me to the, to the main point that I would like to make during the in introductory um, uh, uh, remarks that um, the, uh, the local investor base and, and the local broker community, the, the whole uh, ecosystem that, that Philip just mentioned, are really, really fundamental. Uh, and, and we can tell you just by learning our lessons that it is so. Um, companies want a range of financing sources. They, they want a choice. Uh, again, because of the experience, what it means uh, being addicted to just a single, uh, single financing source. Uh, they also want uh, um, a level playing field, uh, if I may say so. So if the same banks do not require very high corporate governance standards while lending, wh why they, they have completely different uh, requirements when they want to, um, when they consider investment in the corporate bonds of the same company. And they also want adequacy in the policy making when we talk about uh, uh, tightening regulations or a financial transaction tax, which is uh, going to impact the cost of capital and growth, then how do we make those two ends meet? Thank you. So, uh, Martin, from the uh, issue of perspective, how do you see markets working for you at, at the moment from being listed on, a, on an exchange? Yeah, I'm not, not exactly representing the SME part, uh, so for Deutsche Post, DHL, uh, 57 billion revenue company with 460,000 employees worldwide. Uh, I'm nevertheless very Thanks glad so. to uh, have the opportunity uh, looking at the agenda of your conference. I reckon there are a couple of other issues who are demanding your attention. But yes, you know, let's take a look at the issues, right? They're, they're still there. What are, what are they looking for? And. Um, Irrespective of size, to begin with, uh, I, I think what, what we are looking for is basically a liquid marketplace, and uh, we are looking for transparency. Uh, what do I mean with liquidity? Obviously, we want to make sure that there is good trading volume for our for our uh, shares, uh, so we can attract <coughs> also the large. Uh, uh, investors, and you just heard in Seth's keynote uh, what type of size is, is, is required here. Um, how do we track this liquidity? Well, that's a bit of a difficult exercise these days. Um, our market share, I mean, we, we're listed uh, in Frankfurt. Our market share, or the, the, the share of the trading volume in our stock that's done via Deutsche Börse has come down to as little as 34%. So um, that's placed to the other aspect of transparency. Obviously, from an issuer's point of view, you would a, like to know or get a, a, at least a good idea on wh who is your, your shareholder group, how are they structured. Um, so over the years, it turns out you can put a lot of money into the effort of shareholder identification. You can spend a little bit less. Um, the outcome is in any way going to be uh, not, not overwhelming. Um, you are really struggling. So what, what makes me wonder, because we want to make sure in, in terms of efficient uh, markets, we want to make sure that we can target the right investor groups, uh, investor groups that uh, we think could and should uh, invest into our sector and ideally in, into our stock. Uh, step one for that is to, to get an idea on uh, who, who are the investors, what is their investment style. So bottom line is there's an interesting mismatch between the level of uh, uh, reporting requirements. Uh, I think as a company, as an issuer, uh, we have a pretty rigid framework of uh, re reporting. Uh, requirements and we're happy to do that and it's good to see that uh, where there's some initial overshooting in reporting requirements that this is also something that can be uh, cured over time. Um, however, we lack this transparency and any reciprocity here. Um, this is 
not only a problem from the investor relations guy, this has, particularly in Germany, now turned into a problem uh, if we look at the ma massive drop in participation rates in our AGM, in our, in our shareholder meetings. We have seen the, the, the votes that actually go to that AGM that has dropped to just a 46 percent, used to be somewhere in the high 60s, and um, lack of uh, ability or lack of willingness on the custodian bank side to, to deal with that problem. Um, so from an issuer's point of view, we would like to see also the stock exchanges uh, raising their voice in, in that respect. And uh, beyond that, I only can, can agree. Uh, we, we think that uh, equity is going to be a, a very important pillar in company financing of any size. Um, with my IR head on, um, if you're with a large cap company, that's fine. You've got sufficient resources. The framework that's uh, being put around it in terms of reporting requirements, however, uh, doesn't really differentiate uh, between large and small companies, so um, make sure that you offer, particularly the smaller companies, also some uh, support uh, in how to deal with the requirements uh, <coughs> with investors and reportings. Thank you. Just before bringing in Judith, I'd like to get some thoughts from Arke, who's um, recently done a study uh, on the effects um, that, that local markets are suffering, so if you can just have some, uh, maybe some thoughts from, from you on the, on the report you've done. Sure. Yeah, hi, so um, I'm Arge Lindeberg, I'm a partner with KPMG. Uh, we just issued last week a report uh, analyzing the situation actually in the Netherlands and whether the Amsterdam Stock Exchange plays a role in furthering the real economy. And what we found, and I mean, we, our, basically our measure was uh, the amounts raised uh, by companies through, through IPOs and secondaries. But well, we found that, um, and actually I think it's a pretty abysmal figure, uh, to be honest, uh, that over a 10-year period, uh, some of the larger exchanges in, in Europe have uh, achieved one year's GDP, but then 2% of one, 2 to 4, 5% of, of one year's GDP, and then we're talking about 200 billion over a 10, over a 10 year period in capital raising which starts to make you think, okay, what is happening? Uh, and a lot has already been said um, about uh, the reasons. Regulatory is one, uh, but clearly uh, there are other matters as well. Uh, the uh, availability of bank financing uh, right now, um, uh, that's still there, uh, has uh, enabled companies to divert for their uh, growth financing to banks. Actually, debt is drying up right now, um, <coughs> so there is a clear opportunity for exchanges to uh, fill in a gap. Um, however, there are some impediments. Uh, regulation is one, but also uh, the way uh, investment firms are actually measured um, leads them to uh, actually focus their uh, or put relatively more funds into the large uh, companies rather than the smaller companies because it takes less time uh, the large companies are better covered um, and if you make if you want to make some alpha uh, then uh, focusing on large companies uh, yeah has, a, has clearly a, a larger impact than uh, investing in smaller companies. Um, another point is actually a cultural point, and it has not been discussed so far. Uh, in the US, uh, the 401k plans have basically forced retail investors to think about their future p pensions, uh, whereas in the Netherlands, at least, um, pensions could, uh, until very recently, been taken for granted. Uh, so there was a recent study actually on whether uh, young people in the Netherlands are, very, are concerned about their pensions and, uh, and they're clearly not. Um, I'm not sure whether they actually can spell pension. Um, 
another point, I think, is indeed on the, um, on the culture um, around, um, sorry, that, that is installed in entrepreneurs. Uh, I think Mr. De Bakker alluded to that uh, just, just now, uh, in that um, European, and at least in the Netherlands, uh, entrepreneurs do not really like somebody to look over their shoulder, um, whereas in the US, uh, this outside challenge uh, is considered to be much, yeah, to be actually adding value. Uh, but it would, it would be great if Mr. Tsigambo uh, can, can, can comment on that. Uh, and last but not least, um, and this is maybe something that uh, Judith can uh, comment on. Um, actually, what we got back from the 50 odd interviews that we did with people that are really close to the ecosystem and are involved in the ecosystem. Um, we see a change in focus uh, at exchanges themselves to focus on the secondary market. Um, and the secondary market and liquidity um, is clearly impacted more when you focus on or when you uh, accommodate the larger companies uh, and there's less focus on the smaller companies. Um, so these are a couple of points that I uh, wanted to make. Okay. And I have also had some, 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 some potential solutions. Yeah. So Peter, you were going to look at the um, findings from your, from your work on the ESMA, uh, ESMA group. Yes, um, thank you, Anish. In fact, um, I was part of the um, securities market stakeholder group, um, an ESMA um, advisory group, uh, and the board of ESMA asked the group to look into capital market access for companies. And um, it was a very interesting experience because this group happens to me very diversified. So you have issuers, you have investors, but we also had um, private equity people around the table. And uh, when we all sat together and started to brainstorm, we realized that most of the major directives over the last seven years have had a negative impact. Not because that was the intention, but it has been the impact. And in fact, when you look at, for instance, um, VC Capital, yes, they have a, a passport now, but IFMD makes the life, especially of the smaller VC funds, more difficult. Um, companies um, have more difficulties to access loans because of the CRD. Um, issuers, um, as we've heard from the larger issuers, but also the smaller issuers, complain about the, the regulatory burning burden, not only being listed, but also the cost of compliance of remaining a listed company. Um, exchanges, of course, uh, complain about MIFID and the fact that um, uh, to some extent MIFID allowed the cherry picking of the most liquid shares, which is of course the gold liquidity of the smaller exchanges. And then when you look at it from the investor perspective, their sovereignty too made it more difficult to invest into equity. And I think this, the pension fund um, uh, directive was going to, the proposed pen pension funds directive was going to have a similar impact. So the first thing I think we came up with was do no harm. So whenever you look at regulation, the ability of companies to fund and the ability of investors to invest into equity should be part of a mandatory impact assessment. And um, I think another uh, aspect that we looked at was that um, the smaller the countries and the more there are uh, at the periphery, and I think uh, Amintas, I think, um, told a compelling story, the bigger the problem. And we, in fact, um, also noted that because of the redomestication of loans across the EU, EU zone back into the core zone. Uh, there was a, a, a banking loan gap at the periphery. And uh, we also looked at some figures which show that um, if you as a company have the opportunity to get a bank loan, you have a much higher likelihood to also get access to capital markets. Unfortunately, the negative correlation is also true. So the less you're, you have an ability to access bank loans, you can forget about the capital market. So for the periphery, the story becomes very compelling. Now, we firmly, firmly believe that um, exchanges must do more to be at the center of that debate. And um, we also realize that we need to look much more carefully on how we can help the ecosystem around the exchange, not only keep the liquidity, but also make sure that there are 
there are living animals around this liquidity pool that bring a company to the market, that have analysts that cover these companies, that there are brokers that are still willing and able to do uh, an IPO. And um, for that, I think we need a fundamental rethink at the European level because we need to think about the funding of our economy. And just to give you uh, a couple of figures where we compare the EU with the US, Stock market capitalization as a, as a percentage sorry, of GDP in the US is 104%. In Europe, it's a paltry 43%. And the, I, the, the, um, the bank credit uh, capitalization as a percentage of GDP uh, in the EU is 136%. Whereas in the U.S. it's only 55 percent. So there is a huge gap there where Europe really has to make um, progress. And that's also why we welcome the first attempt that the U European Commission is making in looking at long-term investment. You know that there's a green paper out there uh, with a deadline which will expire. And we very much also welcome uh, Philippe de Bacca's excellent own initiative report, which was in fact uh, the, commission, the, the Parliament's um, respond to the Commission's action plan on SME access to finance. So, so I'm just interested to pick up on some uh, comments that both Martin and, and Judith made in terms of the role of exchanges and you know, in particular what, what they can do. So I'm interested to know from, uh, from Martin, you know, what exactly are you looking for when you say uh, exchanges you know, need to kind of raise their voice and, and Judith, where, where are the kind of areas where, where you think you know, exchanges can, can make a specific difference? <coughs> Well, it was good to, to hear also today that uh, the stock exchanges are spending a lot of time on uh, analyzing what is driving investors, what's uh, bringing them to the market. Um, there is uh, different, there's a different intensity of uh, uh, attention when it comes to after the transaction. Yeah? So uh, then you're pretty much left alone. So there's... Uh, maybe a bit more, more effort possible uh, to, to make sure that uh, all the administration stuff, which is not the most sexy stuff on earth, I know, but uh, it is uh, to make sure that there is a decent level of transparency on uh, where at the end of the trading day do we stand in terms of trade flows, and uh, that, that, that would be e extremely helpful indeed. And, uh, to, to answer your question, um, in, in an earlier part of my career, I've been working uh, with, a, with a, a global investment bank as a sell-side analyst. Yeah, I, I was young and needed the money, right? So, and um, and we, we, at that point in time, we were doing a lot of IPOs, also for smaller companies. You re may remember the Neue Markt uh, period in, in, in Germany, and typically for these fairly young family focused uh, companies that were brought to the market they viewed the IPO just like a project a lot of effort and first trading day and then the mental focus was okay now let's go back to work and we had to tap them on their shoulders and said no sorry your journey just began yeah and uh, I think the the examples of uh, having exposure to a broader investor community and being measured up against other companies in the same industry. The examples where this has done an extremely uh, positive impact and effect on the companies are clearly outnumbering the few examples that are also, also there uh, where people say, well, I never would, would go there because we are successful anyway. Well, that's uh, more, than, more the exception than the rule. So yeah. I strongly would recommend also smaller companies to, to focus that. And we in Germany have seen over the past few years uh, also a strong uh, growth in uh, small, medium uh, fixed income issuance. Yeah? So uh, whether that's in the small uh, regional versus and um, Turns out there, uh, we were trying out a lot with the uh, mandatory rating requirements, but it turns out that the market has more of its own opinion there, but definitely a very, very attractive source. So I think, um, you know, from, from all the comments made here, I think there's a, there's a need for a, a, 
you know, kind of a, maybe a dramatic shift in the culture when it comes to looking at how we, how we invest, in, uh, invest in SMEs and help them with access to funding. But given the current regulatory focus on making sure markets are stable and making sure banks are well capitalized and that kind of thing, I mean, are, are you guys kind of confident that, that you know, all these changes, because there's obviously a lot of changes that need to happen to help incentivize funding, but how, how confident are you that um, you, you know, these changes will, will be made? It's, it's the policymaker who's supposed to, to answer this question. Um, uh, not at all. Uh, and that's, that's one of the biggest issues that I'm, and I think a lot of, of people who are active in policymaking are, are, are facing. Um, we have put a regulatory framework in place. Um, and of course, if you again want to temper one by one with all these different types of regulations, I think we will not solve the problem. I think we have to really take a step back and see where are all the unintended consequences of the cumulative effect of all these types of regulations. That will be the only way to really assess where the problem is. And again, you will, we will not be able to solve this with one silver bullet. Again, we will have to see how we can mix and match and adapt parts of these regulations, maybe get rid of some of these regulations, maybe get other regulations in place because we are missing some. Um, so in, in that respect, I'm not at all confident that we will be able uh, to, 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 to fulfill that duty. Um, I only think that it is our job to try to push for it. Uh, and it starts with a good analysis and therefore the green paper is a good first start. The call that the parliament uh, and, and, and myself have done on the commission to make a, a kind of a cumulative impact study on, on, on uh, especially towards a real economy lending, I think is also, would also be a real step forward uh, in that respect. But of course, the, the underlying mentality is, is not going to change very fast. Um, it is a given, and, and I, Judith re made reference to the difference in the US and, 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 uh, and in Europe. Um, if you look, for example, to, to venture capital, they also see a clear difference that even in the venture capital sector, which would, would be the risk-taking sector par excellence, there also you see a difference. Eh? For example, in Europe, there's much more later investment and much more dependence on revenue and, and, and cash flow. It's basically, it's not lending, but I mean, it's basically come, <laughs> it often comes down to that. While in, in, in the US, it's much more focused on growth. So there is a clear difference there, even on the investor side, how they are managing their type of investments. On the other side, there's also, and this was already mentioned several times, and also cultural difference between what do you accept uh, as, as, as an issuer, who is looking over your shoulder, and what is the, the, the the part that, that, that is in front of you. But of course, as long as we are not able and capable because of the regulatory framework and other issues, if all the institutional investors, because of all the different types of regulations, going from solvency to, uh, to CRD4 and whatever, are not able to step into the market and start providing this liquidity in the market, yeah, then, then th there, will, there will be no change. So because they don't see an exit strategy, the initial investors also don't come in. And I think this is something that we have to work on. And again, create a diversity of exit strategies. Uh, listing is, is one, one option. There are a lot of discussions going on for also these this smaller uh, types, these light regimes of, of, of listed companies. This might be a solution, but again, then you have to build or at least keep an ecosystem around it. Eh? You have to have analysts, you have to have uh, brokers. This is something that today is lacking in many, many member states and also at the European level. So I think we have many, many is issues that we have to solve before we will see a, a good step forward. So, so looking forward, and, and um, you know, if, if, if you guys were able to set the EU agenda, and perhaps sticking with you, uh, Philippe, what, what are the uh, what are the main recommendations you, you would make coming coming from your your paper? Uh, there are many recommendations. Eh? There are, of course, again, there are some things that we can do at the European level, and then, of course, you come back to the regulatory discussion that we that we just had now, and I think more, most people agree on that that there are some unintended consequences on how the regulatory framework today is functioning. But at the same time, you, see, you still see that a lot of, of problems are, 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 are at the member state level. There are different tax regimes, for example. Uh, there are different subsidy regimes. Uh, the way that venture capital private equity is treated, the way that people are remunerated, for example, stock options is, is, or is often completely different uh, in, in, in member states. So, um, not to speak about the, the classical discussions about uh, labor market structures and, and these kind of things. I mean, this all feeds into the problem of who still wants to invest and who still wants to be an entrepreneur. And so the problem is, I think, much, much deeper than that. And what we tried to do in, in the, the, the own initiative paper in the European Parliament was really make a list of some concrete examples. And I, I will give you one, one or two. For example, there is a huge uh, difficulty in many member states with bankruptcy law. 
This is something that a lot of entrepreneurs are scared of. Once they go bankrupt, it's often impossible to start a new company or, or they have to mm. stay on the sideline for, for up, up to five years, for example. So changing this might already uh, enable people to, to get much faster a second chance and to, to become this kind of zero entrepreneurs and to also learn from their mistakes. Um, if, you put, if you make one mistake and you have to sit on the bench for five years before you can start again, it doesn't make much sense, I think. So in that respect, these are concrete measures that can, that can be done. Um, something that we also did and uh, is, is uh, in the report and, and mentioned also is really setting, setting up this kind of uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, exchange of information. Oftentimes for bank or investors it's not clear what exactly the business plan is that is presented to them and often to the entrepreneur it's not clear what type of information they have to provide to different types of investors in order to get an investment. So working on that might also already clear up some of the, 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 the problems that arise in, in obtaining the right type of financing. So this exchange of information I think is also very crucial and some member states have handled this very well, um, even uh, making it almost institutional where banks say okay we will start with a group of people putting in consultants, accountants, helping raising a business plan, putting in a small investment when the company grows you step over to maybe classical lending or you go to a, a capital market investor. So these kind of getting the ball rolling things I think is also very important and can be implemented very quickly at member state level. So I meant to pull um, companies, the small, smaller companies listed on the Baltic Exchange, I mean what would you like to see from, from uh, the regulators and from the EU? Mm -hmm. uh, I would pick up on, on the comment from, from Judith as the first one, uh, do not harm. Uh, I think that, that has a lot of sense, especially when we have what 40 financial files ongoing and 11 in the pipeline as, as we heard earlier. That is definitely a challenge to keep a big picture, uh, you know, and, and really um, uh, connect all the, all the bits and ends together. And we have, of course, some alarming signals there, uh, like OTF for equities, like FTT, um, uh, and, uh, you know, also some considerations about the need to legislate maybe corporate governance requirements, again, you know, increasing the, the barriers for entry. Um, uh, and uh, also an important uh, component, I think, talking about um, legislation and regulation is uh, the enforcement, because uh, ensuring level playing field while enforcing, that's critical. And again, uh, talking from our own experience, we can give you numerous examples how our markets suffer because uh, in Poland it's still uh, the, 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 the repatriation of the pension funds outside the country are, is, is restricted and uh, there is a forced uh, capital pool which has to invest locally. So uh, I, I think that uh, this um, level playing field and enforcement is, is very, very critical. Uh, the second um, point and recommendation would be uh, to, to think of the, of the measures and instruments which could uh, stimulate demand in, in, for investments in SMEs. Uh, tax incentives were mentioned and that would be probably the, the most uh, natural, uh, natural area to look at uh, uh, in, in the free capital uh, movement environment. Uh, we all know that interests on loans are deductible. There is nothing, uh, sort of in, in the equity side is not incentivized, so uh, that would be uh, one area. And uh, another uh, uh, recommendation could be uh, to use in some, uh, to, to have a look and, and take, uh, pick up on some positive experience uh, from the European funds which were used to pool resources in the venture capital and business angel uh, area. The, we have uh, again some uh, very positive experience in the Baltics when the European Investment Fund stepped in in the complete vacuum of the venture capital and, and business angel money and pooled uh, resources together with the private investors and not only started the entire VC ecosystem as such, but now the Baltic countries are actually taking uh, among the leaders in Europe in the number of startups and, and the, the youth entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So that has a massive positive spillover effect. So perhaps something of, of the kind could be also used in the, um, in the SME uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, from a, um, the, the larger company uh, being listed uh, from that perspective, I mean, are there any current regulatory changes that you are particularly worried about when it comes to transparency that might make it worse for you to maybe figure out who's holding your stock? Yeah, and I think 
the, uh, the, the approach to that is similar to what we heard already from, from Philip, that there is no silver bullet type of, of action. So you want to make sure that uh, you bring the various disciplines really together, otherwise you really run the risk of accidental over-regulation. And uh, that's something that should definitely be of interest to, to the political uh, scene because uh, pensions is really going to be the issue. And uh, adding yet another benefit, uh, it's an very important element if you as a listed employer can offer to your employees uh, employee stock ownership mm -hmm. programs with uh, all the benefits that this has to benefit loyalty and what have you. Uh, I think it has to be very clear that retail private direct equity investment does have to play a much stronger role in each and every uh, 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 plan and, uh, and anything that works into that direction definitely will find uh, the, the company's support. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and Judith, from the, um, the Securities Market Stakeholders Group, what are the, uh, the recommendations coming, coming from there? Um, this is not from the Securities Market Stakeholder Group because there were like, I think, 20 recommendations. It would be very difficult to summarize that um, mm -hmm. in, in three minutes. But from the, the European um, Stock Exchange uh, perspective, I think uh, there are three things um, <coughs> that we would uh, look at. One is avoid further fragmentation of liquidity because the smaller the liquidity, the more that liquidity is fragmented, the less the stock becomes investable and the more, in fact, um, uh, the local ecosystem suffers. So it, it is a matter of keeping the local ecosystems alive. We need a stock exchange in Lithuania, contrary to what some people might believe. And then the second is stop putting in place disincentives. And uh, Aminta has already mentioned the FTT, but there is definitely uh, in European regulation a very strong bias against equity purely because there is um, the Treasury seat around the table mm. and it is quite clear that sovereign debt uh, always gets uh, a better treatment. And I think this is really something that we need to keep in mind. And last but not least, improve the incentives uh, in investing in SMEs because SMEs is a difficult asset class. Uh, it is riskier. You need to find a vehicle to, to um, mitigate that risk and you could look into an investment fund into SMEs that would then be sort of stimulated uh, into investing directly in, into SMEs maybe alongside the European Investment Fund to give confidence. You can also imagine an index uh, which would also then allow maybe a, a mitigation of the risk but I think we need to think a little bit outside of the box uh, a little bit like, like Patrick Young has invited us yesterday, let's think about outside the box. And I think there is not only the uh, equity in several speakers have said this today, um, we need to look also at, at corporate bond platform. And here again, I think slowly exchanges uh, are putting uh, an offer on the table that will also allow those companies that do not want to part with the e uh, equity to uh, have access to capital, liquid capital markets. For instance, Börse Stuttgart st stands out as an example uh, to the corporate bond for SME finance. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then Argo, from um, your report on, um, well, on the Dutch market in particular, what are the things the Amsterdam Exchange can do to uh, improve the access to capital for, for Dutch companies? <coughs> wow. Um, I mean, one of the recommendations that we make is that um, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange starts to become more active in bringing companies and investors together. Should go out much more, should also be allowed to go out much more, uh, to be honest, um, to um, actually promote the, uh, the exchange uh, and also therefore um, make a contribution in, in, in this cultural shift that we, that we need. Um, so a couple of other points I think uh, that are important uh, to, to mention apart from what has just been said. Um, a small country uh, also suffers from the fact that um, pension funds also try to spread around their, uh, their money uh, broadly uh, so with all markets 
opening up, you have seen uh, a lot of pension money actually flowing out of the, the country and the allocation to smaller countries, like uh, Arminta also just mentioned, uh, is more limited. Um, the question is whether that is whether the concentration risk uh, is actually high. It's uh, uh, whether, whether it's actually appropriately measured um, and um, taking concentration risk is um, punished in a way that is actually detrimental to the society. So I highly recommend um, to put some additional research into yeah, what actually the uh, the side effects are of, of concentration uh, risk uh, treatment and regulation, uh, and in particular the effect it has on, on in particular smaller markets. Um, uh, and this is also this is not only true for pension funds, it's also true for other institutionals, uh, institutional investors. Um, and secondly, uh, I just mentioned uh, the point about how actually large investment firms are are looking at their own performance and how they actually try to drive and improve their performance. Um, clearly they see equity currently, because of regulation, uh, as, a, as a fairly expensive asset class. Um, so in that, in that sense, regulation has done a great job in moving uh, investors out of, a, uh, out of an invest in, in investment class uh, now we actually sit with the unintended consequences um, because we really need equity uh, to, to, uh, to finance growth. Um, the point is that these larger investment firms um, very much, I mean, if they allocate some of their funds to uh, smaller and mid-sized companies, they very much look to um, investment decisions that are being made by focused uh, investors that are focusing, covering small and mid-cap uh, enterprises. Uh, so we have to think about how we can promote uh, these type of investors that are really covering and interested in uh, investments in the companies that we're, we're just talking about. And. Um, I mean, Mark uh, made, a, made a statement this morning about that he's interested in uh, looking around in Europe for his own investments. Um, I mean, that is the type of sort of committed local, uh, sorry, committed pan-European investment approach that one would look for, but there's not that many, uh, or the capacity of these investment firms is, is, not, is not large enough. So just, just before we um, finish the closing statements, I mean, I just, um I had one, one thought from something that Julie said in terms of you know, the need to think outside the box and um, just whether, you know, Judith, more thought needs to be given to the way markets are constructed for SMEs in terms of uh, whether the, the current market structure works for them in terms of you know, continuous, continuous trading model and you know, whether there needs to be more thought to, given to other types of structures that might help facilitate more trading and more incentive uh, to invest in, in companies, mm -hmm. listed companies. If you have any thoughts on um, particular. Yes, I think um, it's like slow food, you know, there's also slow trading and uh, it's probably not a bad idea to go back to the roots for certain to types of um, uh, trading. There was this uh, project, I think it was the Alpine Exchange, who proposed to uh, have a, a one day per week open for trading. Um, I, but there are, I think there are also many other things that are out there. There's crowdfunding as well. I think there are a lot of exciting things going on. And uh, what basically uh, what we need, I think, from the Commission is a more holistic view as to how the funding escalator has to work from um, bank loans to private equity, venture capital, and then maybe for those that one day we'll have an MBA, which is probably graduating on a regulated market. Uh, but if you don't have the, those companies going off the funding escalator, then we will not have people like Mr. Ziegenbach in our panel in 20 years. So we need to make sure that the funding escalator works, works all the way up and that there are uh, incentives uh, all along the way to go there where those companies that are really able to grow and create jobs in Europe can get access to European equity market. I think that's what my recommendation would be to the Commission. 
I left it if you just had Yeah, I just, I, I, I completely agree, and it's, it's also basically the, the, the conclusion of the, of the paper that we wrote in, in the European Parliament, but I'm going to take one step back and be critical to, to myself and my, my fellow policy makers. I think it's also time to stop sending mixed signals. We need a stable framework at European, but also at member state level, that really provides you the opportunity to start investing in a stable environment. That's one. But secondly, this also means that some things are not compatible. You cannot at the same time make, a, as a politician, a statement saying that you want growth and jobs and investment in Europe, and at the same time make a proposal for an FTT. You cannot say that you want institutional investors to come in and to invest more, and at the same time, through CRD4, Solvency 2, make regulations which makes it basically impossible for those institutional investors to come in. So you have to also bear the consequences of your actions. And in that sense, and, and that is my, 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 my call to maybe the next parliament, because this one is, is running, running uh, t towards an end, and also the next commission, to really be more ambitious and more coherent in that respect. It is sometimes very difficult to see, even for us as, as members of parliament, how the incentives are being set for different institutional investors. And they're often party and counterparty to each other, and they have to follow different rules, they have to follow to comply with different, uh, with different sets of regulations, and it makes it just so much more complex uh, on how this, these markets are being formed. And so the, the transparency in the market and the fact that we as policymakers always think that because in the market we see much more complex uh, transactions or deals or, or uh, uh, companies arising that we also have to follow up with complex regulation, I think is the biggest fallacy of the last five years. Complex situations, complex market demand, simple, transparent rules. That should be the, the starting point of what the Commission is going to do for the next five years in order to sort the regulatory mess. Thank you. Thank you.